Hello and welcome to my latest video. In this video I'm going to be showing you how to paint a Cruel Gas Cruciator. Uh, it's one of the uh, new Nighthaunt models from Games Workshop. And you can see I've left, uh, it's been completely built and primed but I've left it in two sections just to make it a little bit easier to um, you know, get into some of those nooks and crannies. So here you can see uh, a previous Nighthaunt model that I did uh, for a Golden Demon uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, but I'm going to be doing the same colour scheme, uh, and this these are three other models from the same army, so I actually kind of always intended to paint them as an army, but I haven't got that far. So, <laughs> um, But this is going to be another model using the same colour scheme. Uh, hopefully I'm going to paint it a little bit quicker than I did those other ones, well, especially the Golden Demon one. Uh, this, so this is more like a tabletop kind of standard thing. You can see here I'm starting off with an airbrush, I'm using a 0 0.4 needle, and I'm just running some Mephiston red through it uh, very simply. The main aim is to get all the red at the top end of the model and then when we paint some of the other colours they're going to be at the other end so it's going to be like light at both ends and gets darker towards the centre. One thing is if you don't have an airbrush you can dry brush this on. Just be aware that if you do that you're going to have a slightly different look to the model. Um, it's going to be I'd say probably a little bit more grim dark if anything just by using the dry brush method you just have to make sure that you're a little bit neater with the painting stage later so obviously when you start off using the airbrush it gives a very smooth finish you can also see how red it makes it because because the finish is so smooth and if you just go over the layers like the the very brightest part a few times it gives a, a very opaque finish to it uh, so that obviously makes it very red and of course next to all the black parts on the model as well it pushes up the contrast. So now I'm going on to some Sotec green and it's exactly the same thing just starting at the bottom and working your way up. Try not to get any overlap uh, if you can help it. So you don't want any of the Sotec green to touch any of the Mephiston red. Uh, and really there's going to be a dark kind of band in between the, the two colours. Um, and as we add more highlights later on uh, they're going to be pushed more towards the very tips of these sort of tendrils at the bottom and the same again for the, the red at the top. It's going to be highlighted more towards the, the sort of head and shoulders area. When you're doing this kind of airbrushing, it, sometimes it can be helpful to mask areas off. It'll just stop you from catching some of the other parts. I tend to find that, especially when I tilt the model upside down a little bit, just to get the undersides of some of these kind of floaty tendrils, it's very easy to angle it so that the airbrush will sort of overspray onto some of the red that you've already done. So again, just be aware of that kind of thing. Uh, and if you're worried that you're going to catch parts that shouldn't be that you've already painted, make sure you mask them off with uh, something. It's, sometimes you can even just use your thumb or whatever, just make sure you get something in the way of uh, other parts of the model. So the pet, basically so the paint doesn't go where you don't want it to. So now we're going to highlight some of the uh, the Sotec green, and it's now up to uh, Lothen blue, I think. Uh, again, same process, but this time you starting at the very tips, and you're going, you're not going quite as high up. So it's going to leave a bit of a transition. Uh, so it's just going to look like it's lighter towards the very tips of the tendrils. Uh, you know, very simple thing. Um, again, watch where you spraying on this. Uh, because also, so not you just have to worry about not getting some of the red area uh, with over overspray, but also um, you don't want to get some of the the darker areas of Sotec green with the overspray as well. Because remember, you're looking for the transition going from light to dark all the way up to the middle. You don't have to worry about things like the uh, the little gravestone or the uh, the arms and the skull and things like that because uh, we're going to be painting over the top of those anyway. Uh, but again, just that the red is really the, the main part to make sure that you don't get any uh, paint on. If anything, uh, actually the, the arms, they're also going to be painted blue. So here you can see I, I just painted them by hand quickly. Uh, you can do it by airbrush as well, um, but because it's so easy to just catch them the, the model. Um, but if you'd masked off around it again, you know, just airbrush those blue to start with. But because you've got to paint over some of the black again, um, you know, it's probably quicker to actually paint them by hand like I did. Uh, but then again, you're taking the lot and blue, then you're going in and just spraying the uh, 
the hand area. So don't spray all the way up the arm. You want the arm, you know, quite dark up towards where it connects with the body. Um, so you know, just get a bit of highlight on the uh, the hands themselves. And then we're going to a final highlight of blue horror. Uh, and this is only on the the very tips of the uh, the tendrils and things. Uh, so don't go crazy with this at all, um, especially because it's a like a quite a light color the lighter colors tend to be a bit harder to airbrush uh, you can end up with speckles and things like that uh, one of the reasons that you that I did a transition going through uh, with love and blue rather than just going straight to the blue horror uh, is because it then gets like a, a transition on that sort of mid color uh, so you don't get quite so obvious speckles between the the light uh, blue horror and the uh, sotek green So there you go, I've gone back over now, painted in all the areas that um, I didn't want to be red or blue, painted them all black, and you can see already how much cleaner and neater everything looks. If anything, you know, that's fine for tabletop gaming at this stage. Uh, if you just go and paint it in some metallic paints over the, uh, the metal parts of the model, um, I think that would be great for tabletop. You know, it's very bold, uh, stand out nice and brightly. Uh, also, by the way, I've just glued some sand to the base, so nothing too fancy. Uh, there's no paint on that or anything. So probably the, the trickiest part of this is um, painting these highlights on the red. Uh, the reason it's tricky is because the red is, because it's airbrushed on, it gives such a smooth finish that if you paint, as soon as you paint straight over the top of it, um, it's quite obvious that um, you're not painting with with an airbrush. So the, the marks will stand out, you know, very kind of, they'll look almost awkward in comparison, um, but you don't need to worry too much about that because with the layering, as I apply it, and then I'm going to do some glazing on top of it, it'll all kind of blend in a little bit. Um, and again, it doesn't really need to be perfect either. It's it's going to be for for tabletop gaming, so you know, don't beat yourself up if you can't get the the marks to blend in too well. Um, remember to keep the paint fairly thin when you're doing this. If you do the paint thicker, well, so. Uh, just before I mention this, actually, I better go through the colours. So, in the bottom right-hand uh, corner of the wet palette, we've got Mephist and Red. Above that, we have Evil Sun Scarlet. To the bottom left is Wild Rider Red, and in the top left, it's Trollslayer, not Trollslayer, um, Fire Dragon Bright. So, obviously, I used Mephist and Red when I was painting in the, uh, you know, with the airbrush. But because it's kind of a transition, and it goes from light to dark. You can see on the red there. Um, you can still go back with them fist and red, and when you paint a line over it, it will show up. One because uh, the the brush gives a very different mark to the airbrush anyway, uh, so it will just naturally stand out. But, but also because some of the translucency of the paint and the transition with the airbrush, um, you will create a more opaque line. So it kind of looks like a highlight anyway. You can see here towards the back of the model when I'm just painting in some of the creases and things, just using my fist and red, uh, it, the marks are still standing out quite clearly. However, also remember that when you first apply the paint, the red will look very vibrant. Then as it dries, it gets a little bit more dull. So it won't stand out as much as you think it does after the first application, but it, it will still kind of stand out a little bit. Um, try and keep the, the lines flowing. That's the most important part. Uh, I just, uh, to go back again, talking about the so the consistency of the paint it's around about um, one and a half parts water to one part paint you want it so that the paint flows quite nicely but you still get a reasonably opaque mark um, once you get kind of over 50 50 then the paint becomes too thick uh, it actually will make your life harder because the the line you won't be able to draw long long clean lines with the, the paintbrush marks um, and the paint will sort of run out quicker whereas if the paint keeps flowing uh, because it's more wet you can do longer cleaner lines with it they just won't be quite as opaque so you might need to do multiple uh, layers with it but I think you can see here as it's dried like how the the, um, the lines have sort of blended into the model a bit more clearly as opposed to when I was first applying them and you saw how bright they were you know how they popped out quite so strongly. If you want a really strong red colour, don't over highlight this. Lots of people always ask me how I paint my reds and keep them nice and vibrant. 
uh, the main thing is, you know, don't do too many highlights. As soon as you start highlighting red, so you either add kind of uh, white or yellow, they're the, the two most common options. Uh, sometimes people use skin tone as well, which is basically just a mixture of uh, sort of white and yellow. So something like the flesh tone or whatever, um, those sort of things can be quite nice for highlighting. So it's sort of like balancing between making it pink or orange for the highlights. But th the thing is, as soon as you start adding highlights to the red, you're actually taking red away. Uh, so let's say we just use white as a highlight, uh, and this would indicate that it's a, like a white light hitting the model. The more white that you add, the less red is visible. And because you're adding white to the paint, it makes it pink, so you just made a pink model. That's why it doesn't look red. Uh, it do, it, it's not quite the same with black, so obviously as you add more black to it as a shadow, uh, you're still taking the red away, but the red that's left is there's then the high contrast against it, so the red stands out against the black, so it actually makes the red look stronger. Whereas that's not the case when you add white, because the white is brighter and it kind of like overtakes the, the colour. So yeah, just keep that in mind. If you want to keep something a really strong red, the best way is to just use uh, shading uh, and don't put any highlights on. Now obviously that's not realistic. Uh, if you go out and look at... Um, red items out in bright sunlight they don't actually look that red generally speaking um, if it's in direct light if it's in kind of like the shadowy sort of area you see the red more clearly if you look at say a red car uh, where the light hits it directly it kind of it, it looks sort of pinky or whatever it reflects the sky color a little bit um, it's white light on it uh, so you know it is realistic that you're going to get um, different colors on red you know it's going to take away some of the red or the, you know, you're going to get desaturation on it but if you want to keep a really strong vibrant red then don't highlight it um, you can see here now I'm adding in some shading so what I'm using is a bad and black and I'm just glazing into the shadows now by glazing all it is is watered down paint so there's no special mediums or anything like that you just take uh, one drop of uh, black paint mix in some water around about four or five parts water to one part paint uh, it doesn't have to be too exact now the thinner the paint so the more water you add it means you get a like a, a more translucent layer when you apply it when you load up the brush you can get pl plenty of the uh, the glaze on there but make sure you rub it off on a kitchen towel because you don't want it's not a wash you know you don't want to make the model swim in the paint it's just a very thin layer and it dries quickly um, and it kind of the paint goes exactly where you place it, so it's like a layer of paint. If you load up the brush and you don't rub it off on kitchen towel, when you touch the model, it'll turn into a wash and it'll just flood the area and run in all to the in toward the crevices. Um, but because it's uh, water and it's not kind of like uh, say if you use a contrast uh, paints that Games Workshop do, they have uh, special things in there to make it kind of stick into the recesses because. Uh, so if you're just using water it doesn't kind of work like that so it doesn't go completely into the recesses and what you actually tend to find is you get it darker just before the recess um, so you know just be very careful when you're doing glazes you don't want to turn it into a wash um, you you know it's just a, a very thin layer just to kind of darken areas down but it also blends things together uh, so remember this is a, a tabletop model so I'm not going to spend a long time on any of these processes but if you do you know all of these processes you could do a really high level uh, painted piece you know just with layering and glazing and things like that uh, it's just a case of taking longer making sure that things are done very neatly um, you know uh, and really practicing with your, your brush control to make sure everything is as clean and neat as you can make it but the techniques themselves you know they're all fine for tabletop or for display painting So you can see the kind of the midsection of the the red area here, where I painted in using fist and red some creases. So these aren't sculpted onto the model; these are just kind of areas where I've added extra detail. Uh, they will look a little bit harsh for a start. Obviously, when it dries, it uh, dulls down a bit, as I've already mentioned. But um, they they still kind of stand out as like a hard line because it's a big contrast jump between uh, the red and the, the black underneath. 
But if you then take either the Mephi Mephiston Red or the Abaddon Black or both and water them down into glazes, you can glaze over those areas and it'll soften the transition between the two. Um, so if you obviously glaze the, the Abaddon Black over the, the red lines you've put on, glaze the, the black over the top, uh, it'll dull the red right down. It'll still look quite red though, but it just means that it's a, a lower uh, tonal contrast step between the, the black and the red so it looks more blended in and makes it look softer. Um, the highlight parts on this model uh, are just going to be on the creases really so you can see here on the uh, sort of shoulder area um, so this is where I'm taking it up to Wild Rider uh, and also the Trollslayer Orange. Now when I originally painted the, the highlights on the the photos of the, the Nighthaunt models that you saw at the beginning those um, yeah, the one the uh, fire dragon bright that I used on those, it was dried out a little bit, uh, so I actually made much kind of cleaner lines, very you know more uh, distinct when I painted them on. When I tried this, this was a new pot. It was thinned down a little bit. The paint flowed slightly differently. It wasn't as opaque as I remembered the uh, my previous color being. So um, you can see there, it looks the highlights look a little bit softer. All this means is you just have to ha add in. Um, well, you can add white to it, or I ended up using, I think, um, a shanty bone I added to it uh, at one point, just to get the, the very sharp highlights at the end. Uh, but remember what I said, if you take the highlights too far, um, you're taking away some of the red colour. So try and keep the, the highlights themselves quite thin. It's important to note that for this painting that I'm doing, it's not realistic at all. Um, you know, this isn't really how light falls or anything like that. It's a very stylized look that I'm going for on this piece. So, you know, I'm just kind of picking out things to make them high contrast or, you know, work on, on focal points and things like that. And you can see the focal point because it's very close to the head. So the head and chest area is usually a good point to pick as a focal point uh, because people always tend to look at, the, you know, the head area on a model. Uh, and just these other parts of me just picking out details and creases and things and then pushing up the, the contrast a little bit higher by you know going up the uh, the brightness so I'm going through um, as I said Wild Rider Red uh, Trolls, no, Fire Dragon Bright and then Shabti Bone mixed in with it a little bit if you also want um, to really push the, the contrast on the highlights you can go to Pure Shabti bone or maybe even take it up to white uh, and that will but if you do go up to white make sure the highlight the final highlight is very small um because otherwise it's going to look you know it's the the, con the contrast step is just too high uh, and it'll stand out too much but you can see here just these little tiny highlights i think it's quite clear to see at this stage now that these highlights aren't realistic uh, and it's just a case of you know me going for the, the stylized look to make them stand out nicely I did find this model was sculpted slightly differently to the previous uh, Nighthaunt. So if you go back and look at the photo that I put up with the uh, the Chaingast uh, models, the creases on the cloaks for them were much sort of uh, smoother, whereas they're kind of smoother and sort of more flowing. Whereas if you look at like the the creases around the uh, the shoulders and arms on these, they're almost angular with how hard they are. So. Uh, that is kind of like why I chose to do these this one sort of a more stylized way. Um, it still fits in quite close to the army, but also like I painted the as I said these those previous uh, Nighthawk models quite a long time ago. So um, I actually had to go and check some of my uh, old work in progress shots just to remember how uh, I, uh, I actually painted these. But um, you know, as I said, it, it fits in pretty closely with uh, the rest of the models. You can see I'm just going back with a little bit of the Mephiston Red um, thinned down just to knock back some of the highlights a bit because I, I was thinking you know, that the highlights had gone too bright um, uh, and overpowering. But it's, it's just a case of you know working backwards and forwards a little bit until you get something that you're happy with. Generally speaking though, for most of the highlights, I would say... Um, Kind of try and stick to the uh, Evil Sun Scarlet. Um, it's about, yeah, it, when you first apply it, so you can see there, uh, it looks like a really nice strong red, uh, but it's quite sort of orangey really. So the more of it that you add, 
uh, again the the more sort of are you taking away from the the redness of the model whatever you do don't go too crazy with the uh, the evil sun scarlet and cover the whole thing because then it's gonna as I said it's gonna look very uh, orangey but also you're taking away the that dark uh, sort of mean high contrast look um, from especially as it goes further back and also don't forget that the big cross goes on top of the model so you want some sort of shadow area on the the back section because you know the cross is going to hide a lot of the light from hitting there you can see now that I'm painting some more kind of long sort of streaks and things so it's just a case of me just adding more painted details on uh, you know so for added creases that kind of thing and again this is purely uh, up to you if you want to add these kind of details or not so the model has obviously got creases sculpted into it uh, if you just want to add more detail or whatever then you know kind of that's what I'm doing here but um, it's it's nothing too fancy. Unfortunately, the uh, the chains on this actually get in the way a little bit of doing these, these nice uh, long lines. So, uh, you know, it's easy if you don't do them. But the thing is, uh, you'll see in a moment when I move on to the lower section of the model that I'm going to be doing a very similar kind of thing with the, the tendrils that come out the bottom, that you know the, the spooky bits. <laughs> And you can see there's not any of creases sculpted on there, so you, um, I think you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about when I paint those on. Uh, they're a bit more subtle on the red, but it kind of just it, it, you'll see when it's finished, the um, it'll all work together with these sort of brush lines on there. So the idea is obviously to use the uh, Evil Sun Scarlet to paint on the lines quite chunkily and then you go over the top of them again with uh, Wild Rider Red but you make the lines thinner. And if you ever get, you know, you start adding too many so it becomes sort of pinky orangey then you have to water down some Mephiston Red and just, you know, dull it down again. I'm using a size 1 uh, Artisopus brush that uh, allows me to do quite thin lines well, as I'm going over the top so you can see here with the uh, Wild Rider Red but also um, if I want I can do the, the chunkier lines just by pushing the brush a little bit harder uh, whereas if I was just using, so I normally use a size 00 for most things uh, for painting details um, because it allows me to do uh, very nice long straight lines and I can push a bit harder or softer and this thickness of the line doesn't change too much uh, whereas with this uh, brush uh, as I push more the line becomes thicker and thicker so you have the option of going wrong more easily with the, the thicker brush but you can drag the brush for longer because obviously there is more paint that you can fit into the, the body the, the well of the brush but um, and also like because I don't want the lines to be quite so hard have you know having that option to just paint them a little bit thicker in places uh, kind of sort of smushes them out a little bit so you can have areas of very high uh, sharp detail and then it sort of softens in a little bit in other areas so you can see there now I'm just you know, spending a little bit of time uh, picking out some of the lines. Uh, and if, if you pay attention to the brush marks I'm making, they're very, uh, they're always pulled towards me. If you want to do like a long, neat line, always pull the brush towards you. Never push the brush because the bristles will splay out, uh, and it you know you'll make a bit of a mess. You can see, obviously, I spent a, a little bit more time painting on lines and things, um, just to get those details all over there. Uh, it's probably a little bit over the top with how I've done it, especially because on the, the top bit here at the back, the uh, as I said, the cross goes over the top there, so you can't really see it that much. But you know, sometimes you just get carried away or whatever. Uh, but you know, is they're interesting details to put on there anyway. And 
And you can see now I've also swapped over uh, to a size 00 now, although the brush is quite old. Uh, so if you actually look at the, the bristles a little bit, you can see that there's, there's quite a lot of buildup, uh, especially towards the ferrule. Uh, and also the tip was worn down a bit as well. Uh, but, it, you know, I just find it a little bit easier to uh, pick out some of the lines without having to worry about making a, a fat mark where I don't want one. So now we're walk, working on the uh, the lower section, you know, the spooky tendril bits. Uh, it's going to be a very similar process, but what you will see is that the lines as I put them on, they're going to look sort of very messy. Um, to go over the colours, so in the bottom right, it's Sotek Green. We're not going to use that too much, really, for the line work. I'm starting off with the Lothen Blue. and uh, But, you know, I can just dip the, the brush every now and then back into the Sotek Green as I get closer to the, the midsection, because remember, when I airbrush that on, the paint will be translucent, so you get some of the black primer showing through underneath. You can see these lines that I'm painting on now, and you'll look at that and think, wow, those look horrific, very messy, um, which is fine. You will see as the process goes further, uh, they're very easy to tidy up. And also the Lothen Blue is quite translucent. So remember, around about one and a half parts uh, water to one part paint, you get a very fluid uh, color like that. Now, you know, don't use it as a, um, like a standard mixture. Uh, each paint is different. Lothen Blue doesn't have amazing coverage, uh, but it's close enough that you can thin it down that much. Other paints, if you want to make a, a mark like this, you'll find it, it tends to be yellows especially. If you try and thin them down one and a half parts water to one part paint, um, when you start trying to paint a line, it just becomes almost like a glaze because the the translucency of the paint is so, you know, it's so thin that you, it's hard to get an opaque mark on there. Um, but it, it's just purely a case of practice um, and also bear in mind that uh, so I talked about on my Fire Dragon Bright how it felt a little bit different compared to the previous colour that I'd used when I opened the new pot you know each pot of paint is different um, and it can be because one's dried out a little bit more so it's actually made it uh, thicker in the pot so when you apply it um, you're actually you know you're working with different consistencies even though if you take them freshly from the pot it's one's dried out more than the other uh, and also you know you always get slight variations in paint mixtures and things as well when the companies mix up the colors um, but anyway you can see now the lines that I've painted on I've gone over them a few times um, still quite messy uh, but one of the main things as well is that the paint as it dries it becomes duller again so you know when it first goes on there you think oh it's very strong, bright, and, and messy. As it dries, it sort of blends in a little bit. But you know, going over it a few times does help to uh, sort of make it more opaque and neaten it up a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the wet palette uh, cut out on me. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what happened to the videos for it. I couldn't find any of the information, but uh, I'll talk you through it anyway. So, obviously, um, the three colors were Sotek Green, Lothen Blue and Blue Horror. Uh, so now I'm going over it with the the Blue Horror. You have to be a little bit careful. Uh, it is a light, you know, a very sort of white colour. It'll look sort of um, a bit bitty uh, and it won't flow as well as the other two colours because of the, the white pigment in, the, uh, in that colour. Um, the main thing that you're doing at this stage, though, is you're just going over the lines that are already there. You have to be, a, or try and be, a little bit neater than you were. The uh, the lines will obviously work better towards the very tip of the tendrils uh, because as you go over it, it's not such a large tonal jump. If you take this blue horror colour and you go all the way up to the very midsection, the tonal jump between the Sotek green, which is translucent, so some of the black comes through, so it's even darker, and then you, if you put the uh, the blue horror on top of that is such a big contrast jump it'll stand out really badly you don't want to go too crazy with this this is just for highlighting the tendrils stick towards the lower sections uh, or the, the lines that you've already done and you painted on top of them one really important part actually that I painted on this you can see this sort of like that little ridge the brightest part that I'd already painted on not this bit that I'm doing at the moment but on the there's tendril next to it to the left you see how there's that sort of hard little ridge there that's sculpted into the model yeah, I've painted that out as quite a, a light highlight now I know it stands out fairly strongly at this stage um, but what you'll find is that 
as the model comes more becomes more close to being finished that stands out nicely as a, a nice little interesting detail uh, and rather than making every single line that I've painted match up to the brightness of that um, I'm not going to do that I'm going to keep that little bright section as that the brightest part of the tendril uh, and it'll work as a sort of a, an interesting little focal point um, well, you see at the end of the video anyway, like you're still going to spend time painting all the, these details on there and making them a little bit neater, but um, just having little parts like that that stand out more, that, that make like, interesting visual points on the model, rather than having everything look the same. And when that happens, what is you tend to just glance over it um, and you think, oh, that looks nice or whatever, but you don't notice anything on it. Whereas having these little points of interest, they just make the model more interesting to look at. You can see again the uh, the brush marks that I'm using. They're all dragging marks, so they're all pulling the brush towards me. You get much better flow, much better movement uh, if you can do that. Any mark that we can do that, we can pull the brush towards you. You have way more control over it. Even going sideways uh, is not going to give as nice and clean a mark as it is when you pull the brush towards you. The other nice thing is, as you're pulling it towards you, you can slightly lift off. So you start off, you add uh, quite a bit of pressure, and then you lift off. And because of the taper of the brush, that put, leaves a tapered mark on the model as well. So there you can see I've been um, putting the, these uh, lines all over it. They still look quite messy, but now we're going to clean them up, and it's going to make actually a huge difference. So what you do is you take the Sotec Green, uh, you turn it into a glaze again. So around about, f I'd say four parts water to one part paint for this one. You, you still want a, like a reasonable amount of um, coverage. So it's a, there's a bit of opacity there. You want you know some color to show through. You're just going through, uh, and this time you're painting all towards the darker section on the model. So you kind of like shading it. Uh, whatever you do, don't pull the paint down towards the highlight points on the tips of the tendrils. Uh, because you add colour to those, it dulls them right down. You you know you, you get the opposite effect of what you want. You want those sections at the bottom to be the brightest points. Um, so you're glazing upwards towards the midsection. Again, it's a glaze, not a wash. Don't load the brush up and forget to rub it on the kitchen towel. If you do that, it's going to run into all the recesses. You don't want this in the recesses. Keep those dark. You want this to stay like in the big flat areas. You keep and if you keep rubbing this over. Um, you know the lines is going to have the same so I talked about this on the, the red color as well but as you apply this over it dulls it down everything sort of blends together uh, you can see now I'm using some bad and black as well uh, so it didn't matter by taking the Sotec green up towards the midsection obviously that would highlight it a little bit because black is darker than the Sotec green um, but it's, it was more important to get the smooth finish using the glazes so now you can go back with the bad and black and you push that up towards the midsection. Don't be too precious about the midsection really though, uh, right under the cloak, because again, the big cross is going on there. It's gonna be very hard to see a lot of it. It's just a case of um, making sure that, you know, the area is sort of roughly around it, as you see, it can be blended and dulled down. But I think you can kind of see uh, how the lines are now looking much, much smoother. So even though I was very rough when I applied them, um, you know, with glazing on top of them, it looks makes it look much neater and smoother. Um, you can also see when I'm applying these marks that I'm pushing the paint rather than dragging it. Uh, this is purely from a video perspective, so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, ideally, I would be have the model upside down and pulling the the paint towards me. Um, it's you know just tricky having to flip the model around all the time when I'm doing videos. So, you know, try not to push the paint too much when you're doing it. If you pull it towards you or, you know, at least do it sideways or whatever, uh, you'll have a little bit more control. So you can see actually on my paintbrush how the bristles have sort of splayed out a bit as I've been pushing the brush away from me. Um, you know, it's just what happens. Um, so <laughs> you can see the results there. Um, now that you've glazed over it, you can uh, tidy it up a little bit, pick out a few more areas. Um, go back with the uh, the blue horror to pick out some things. You can see there as well, I have this uh, 
whiter color. This is actually um, white gray by Vallejo. You can use a you know a, a white color if you want. It doesn't have to be the, the Vallejo color. Uh, I do find that the Vallejo color in this particular case is quite opaque, so you get a, a nice um, you know very solid color. It's just off white, but that's close enough to white. It's fine. But you know if you have a, a white Games Workshop paint. It's fine to use that as well. Just be a little bit careful with how you apply it. You're using it in very small areas. Um, you know, you've you've done all the tidying up and all the the kind of like the heavy brush working and these lines on there. Don't ruin them by adding too much white. Just you know, pick out some small spots. Um, you know, details and things like that. So again, nothing too fancy, but also remember that you wanted the lower section of the uh, the tendrils to be, you know, the lighter. So uh, this is where you you know you're adding the, the the highlights just to, and you're pulling them down all towards the tip at the bottom. And also you could see that I was picking out a few edges. Um, so you know, just put a bit of paint on your brush, rub it off on your thumb so there's no blobs of paint, and then just using the side of the tip run it along the edges and you get a nice little edge highlight there it's quite clean you're letting the brush do all the work pretty much um, and just helps to define the shapes a little bit better so obviously i mean it still looks a little bit messy obviously it's, it's zoomed in a little bit um and remember it's a, a tabletop piece so uh, again, you can use these techniques, you can spend as long as you want making it as neat as you possibly can um, and you can get you know, some very high quality finished pieces just using these same techniques. Um, again, same colours, same process on the hands. Uh, I, I for The way I designed the colour scheme it was the, uh, the kind of the ghost spooky bits are the, the Sotec green and then um, I used the red as like a, a strong contrast against it. Um, and you'll see also at the very end there's going to be like a strong green yellow flame coming from the skull that is holding as well that'll work really nicely as a spot color and stand out quite strongly so you can see the marks as well that i'm painting on here uh, well first thing you'll notice i'm back to using the, the thinner brush i don't need any fat marks on these so i'm not using the size one anymore um, uh, and it's just picking out small details and things. Uh, look for how the model is sculpted. Follow the lines uh, and the flow of the, the sculpting. If you kind of like, if you you just follow the sculpting, even if there's nothing sculpted on a certain area, but if it, sort of the sculpting direction goes in that sort of flow, if you keep the brush to follow that sort of flow, that you know those angles and things, it makes everything sort of work together and it makes it look neat. Whereas if you start putting lines that go cross sections over um, flowing lines, then they instantly become quite jarring and stand out a lot. But yeah, I think it's pretty obvious what I'm doing, just picking out the uh, little sculpted details. Uh, Anything that you think looks like it needs a highlight, you know, don't spend too long doing this. Um, I actually, so originally I picked this model because I thought, oh, um, it's a very simple model to paint, should be nice and quick. Uh, and I was kind of wrong about that. The problem is um, all these long spindly details like the arms and the chains and things, um, you know, you have to paint them all the way around. So there's actually a lot of surface area. If you flatten this model out, it's actually really big. Uh, and because it's all details as well, you can't, you know, on the chains and things on these long thin areas, uh, you can't do quite as many quick, uh, simple brush marks as I wanted. So while like the red and the uh, the blue were nice and quick to paint, the chains um, and the, the cross on the back were actually quite a pain. Um, so, but you know, if you're painting Nighthawk, you don't have to paint this particular model or any of the uh, the other models in the the range. Uh, will work quite nicely. 
for the you know the, the quick sort of flowing uh, brush marks. Uh, for the head, I'm painting it in a uh, non-metallic style. Um, if you find at this stage that you've had enough and you just want to get it done, you can very quickly just paint in like a, a gold or bronzy coloured like true metal colour and give it a wash and you know the job will be done. It's still going to look quite nice on the tabletop, but uh, because I, the way that I'm painting this army, as I said, it's very stylized. Um, I'm using a, sort of like a very bold non-metallic. Uh, it's not... Uh, super realistic it's just kind of high contrast uh, so it stands out very nicely um, some people say you know non-metallics aren't good for the tabletop uh, but particularly this style of non-metallics on a tabletop because it's so high contrast and bold uh, it stands out really nicely uh, and also because of the way the light works that you know any highlights that you've painted on you can make them match on the non-metallics and so everything actually becomes uh, it stays consistent on the model. Um, so just to go through the colours that I'm using, uh, there is uh, XV88, Baylor Brown, uh, those are the two colours at the bottom. So in the bottom right is XV88, bottom left is Baylor Brown. Above the Baylor Brown is Baylor Brown mixed with Ice Yellow. If you don't have Ice Yellow, Dawn Yellow uh, is a very close approximation. Obviously the top left is uh, Ice Yellow. Uh, top right is um, Rhinox Hide, uh, and below that is Mournfang Brown. Mournfang Brown is quite an important colour. Uh, it's one of my favourites actually for doing non-metallic kind of goldy sort of colours. Is uh, it's because um, it has really good translucency. <laughs> that means it doesn't cover very well, but it has a fantastic. Uh, sort of richness to the colour. Um, it really adds that sort of warm, glowy, sort of hot spot kind of uh, thing on the highlights. Uh, so I find it very useful for that. Uh, you can see the, the marks I'm doing. They're a lot uh, thinner than uh, and quicker as well than the, the marks I was using uh, for the uh, the red and the, the blue. Um, and I'm keeping them all kind of roughly parallel and just using the very tip of the brush. It, uh, it's a slightly different, um, I'd say more advanced style of painting in that you just have to be, you, you just need slightly better brush control with how you do it um, because you're sort of blending while layering. Uh, if you find you struggle a little bit with it, um, don't worry too much. You can do the same thing that I did on the red in that you sort of glaze over the top just to blend it together. What well, red and blue, I did the same thing, you know. So if you do like quite big chunky marks you layer on top going through you know from xv88 up to the ice yellow um so we xv88 bail or brown bail or brown mixed with ice yellow then ice yellow um you know you can go through those layers making it smaller each time um it's going to look a little bit sort of it won't be quite as elegant if you don't do all the little marks uh, to help them blend together um but when you know when you glaze over sort of the the transitions at the end um it'll still kind of work as long as you get the the high contrast uh look to it you know so um i mean you'll see what i mean as the, the painting progresses i think it's already starting to look a little bit there so the how light the ice yellow is compared to the well it's basically black still some of the black uh, primer sections And then I've got obviously the uh, this edge highlight going all the way around um, helps to define the shape. And putting in these little shine spots um, again that pushes the uh, the contrast, but it also um, again helps to define you know the edges and things. Um, and that having like a, a little dot you know really helps with the uh, making it look sort of like it shines. But again, remember, it's not super realistic for uh, for non-metallic cis. You can see some of the marks that I was putting on there when I was doing those edge lines. Um, they weren't kind of consistent so they're a little bit bitty uh, that just uh, kind of gives helps to give the impression of 
the line being broken. Obviously, this uh, kind of helmet that he's wearing, uh, it's, sort of, it's seen a bit of wear. Uh, so, and obviously, there's already sculpted battle damage on it. So, I kind of like want to push that element further. Uh, so, if you leave breaks in the highlights as you put them on around the you know the, the edge highlights and things, it gives the impression that there's dents and things. Uh, with light catching little imperfections in those lines. You can see there that I used some of the uh, Mornfang Brown and I went over it and you can kind of see the, the richness of the colour as it comes in now. So it looks more like a sort of a, a bronzy look. And for some of the blending, um, if you find that you are struggling with the blending on it, you can um, you know, don't wash the brush in between changing colors and what that will do is um, as you apply the next color the previous color will blend in as you you know the more marks that you make the more the colors will blend in uh, so you kind of like blending on the model uh, you know without having to mix any new colors uh, it's a very quick and easy way to get uh, a blend onto a model uh, obviously don't forget to do the uh, the other side of the, the helmet but because I've got the light coming from the left hand side uh, you don't want to highlight the right hand side quite as brightly so that big line like sort of highlight shine on the top center of the model um, you know you're not going to do that on the right hand side um, and you can see so I'm using now some of the the Rhinox hide uh, it just sort of blends in um, so one of the things that people use for non-metallics is light next to dark, dark next to light, that kind of thing to push the high contrast. Now that's not always correct if you want to do realistic non-metallics, but for this very kind of quick uh, and simple uh, non-metallic, uh, you know, it, it works really well. Uh, so you can see how I've got it dark um, as it goes towards the, uh, the center line, whereas on the left-hand side, it's light at the center line. So then you've got a high contrast uh, you know light highlight next to a dark section and then if you look on the very far right that I'm now painting in uh, you can see how I'm highlighting it again there so it, basically it goes light dark light and then you know just to uh, finish it off and make everything a little bit smoother again. I've got some of the more fang brown, watered it down. This is probably more like three parts water to one part paint. Uh, you know, more fang, as I mentioned, it already has pretty poor coverage, so um, you know, you don't need to water it down quite that much. Uh, you know, if you water it down too much, actually, it takes a long time to get the glaze uh, to have any effect. Now that's not said that would be wrong, if you want to do a very smooth, clean finish, if you water down the glaze more, um, as I said, when you first apply it, it's not going to have a big impact, but if you do multiple layers, uh, you can do very fantastic, smooth transitions, uh, but it, you can end up, in some cases, taking hundreds of layers of glazing. Um, and you might say, well, why don't you just use an airbrush to do it? like a smooth transition quickly it will do a smooth transition quickly uh, and it's probably something that you're only going to uh, experience in the flesh for the difference in the quality uh, but if you you know you airbrush something it looks kind of flat with the transition whereas if you glaze there's all these fantastic uh, sort, of, sort of depth to the layers uh, it makes a big difference when you see it in the flesh anyway Uh, so now I'm just going to paint in the side of the helmet. Uh, it's pretty much exactly the same process. The th main thing to look for is how the, the light would uh, catch in there. Now, uh, again, as I mentioned, I'm not painting this super realistically. Uh, I'm using the XV88 at this stage, um, but I'm using sort of little tricks that kind of work uh, in terms of how the light would fall. Uh, or rather how the the light would highlight. So there is a curve, quite a strong curve on the inside of the, the face of the, the mask. So on like the you know the the main part of the curve, if you put a highlight there and you leave it dark underneath 
as it curves up under that ridge, then you've already got the, the light dark light element going again. So you get the high contrast, um, you know, which makes the highlights stand out even more. Um, but, you know, then it's, you have to use the light volumes as well. So you don't want like an even transition. It's not a case of going from dark, say, you know, and keeping the, as it goes into the highlight, keeping the highlights the, the same distance. Um, it, the main block of the highlight is quite a big chunky highlight and then the transition is just at the very edges so you can see here now as I'm applying the Baylor Brown I'm almost entirely covering the XV88 uh, you might say well why not just use the Baylor Brown to start with well one is it, um, Baylor Brown is a slightly lighter color it's not got quite as good coverage uh, whereas if you do the XV88 first you will cover the you know you'll only need maybe one layer or two layers of Baylor brown on top of that and you'll have a, a you know a good finish and you've also started the uh, the transition at the top so you need a, to leave a little bit of the xv88 at the very edges um but you know the main block of the highlight is done so you, you won't get a vastly different result if you use two layers of Baylor brown as opposed to one layer of xv88 and one layer of Baylor brown you know it's doing the same kind of thing but you kind of speeding the process up by starting with XV88 and Baylor Brown because you're getting already a transition at the edges by leaving some of the XV88 there. And then it's the same process again. So then when it's the Baylor Brown mixed with the ice yellow, uh, you put the highlight on top again. Um, you know, just be aware it's a little bit more tricky to get the, the paintbrush in there, uh, especially for me because I'm having to hold it at awkward angles so that the, the camera can see what I'm doing. But um, it kind of it is important when you're painting to try and find the comfortable positions you'll do your best best work when you're doing that um you know so you know try and always hold the model in, in a comfortable position so that you can do the best brush marks that you can you can see now i'm up to the ice yellow uh same process again going over the top i'm just picking out sort of the the raised harder edges on the details uh, you know, it helps them stand out, and it you know it gives that sort of bling kind of look. Um, hopefully, you'll do that detail a little bit better than I did. You can see how it sort of blobbed and things a bit there. I'll uh, neaten that up um, off camera, pretty much. Um, but just to give you another quick idea of how to do the non-metallic, so I'm going to do the uh, the lock here. Uh, it's much much easier to do it on this because it's very open. Um, so you can see I'm just starting with the XV88. Um, very roughly blocking in the lower section of it. Uh, you don't even worry about the rivets and things on there. Um, you know, you can just paint straight over the top of them. Um, if you try and keep the uh, the direction of the brush marks, again pulling towards you, um, and it doesn't even matter if there's a little bit of texture on there. Uh, it just adds to the you know the interest of the piece having these texture marks on there not everything has to be a smooth perfect transition uh, so now again with the, the Baylor Brown going over the top so you it's pretty much just going from uh, black at the very top so you're not going over that too much at this stage uh, going through XV88 to Baylor Brown at the very bottom there Now up to the 50-50 mix of Baylor Brown and Ice Yellow. Uh, this is, again, same process, but you're leaving more of the, the Baylor Brown uh, visible. You know, So each time you add another layer, it's a smaller amount that you're adding, You know, a smaller area that you're painting in. You see there my paint starting to uh, dry out a little bit as well. I'm not getting a, a perfect finish. Again, it doesn't matter too much. It's just um, kind of adding a bit of texture to the, the look of the piece. So now I'm using Mornfang Brown. This is the the glazed, uh, the glaze that I mixed up. So it's around about, you know, three or four parts water to one part paint. Um, don't go over the very bottom section. It's just adding a, a bit of color, a bit of warmth, uh, and helping to mix the transitions together. So there are some dents and things sculpted into it as well. Um, I wasn't too bothered about picking those out, but um, because of the uh, sort of scratchy nature of the marks I've already painted onto it. It all sort of blends together anyway. 
and then all you're doing is just going through uh, with the 50-50 uh, the mix of Baylor Brown and Ice Yellow and plus the Ice Yellow itself um, going around all the edges uh, anything that faces upwards or sideways pick out as a highlight don't bother with anything that faces downwards uh, and th that will help to kind of reinforce the top down lighting here you can see now I'm using the ice yellow just to pick out some of the edges a little bit brighter um, and the idea of this is that uh, with light uh, it becomes more intense on very fine edges, uh, curves, things like that. So those will naturally stand out more uh, rather than you know, flat, dull surfaces. There I am, just kind of neatening it up a little bit again with the, uh, the Mordfang Brown. But again, don't you know? Don't spend too long on these uh, little areas. Uh, yeah, again, just to reiterate, it's it's a tabletop piece. Um, I think it is a, like a character model or something like that. Anyway, uh, you know, it works on its own. So a little bit of effort on the model just to help it stand out as a, a nice piece. But um, you know. Don't, don't kill yourself uh, trying to pick out all these details perfectly. Um, I just wanted to show you this quickly. This is the uh, sort of, I guess it's like filigree, sort of fancy sort of details on the uh, the cross thing that he's wearing. Um, I'm guessing it's like, maybe it's a torture rack or something. I just realized he's got all the spikes on the inside that's against him. <laughs> and they're not on the back of the, uh, the piece. So yeah, it, it's a, sort of like a torture device, I guess. Um, but anyway, uh, so using XV88, uh, non-metallic style, uh, what you're doing is picking out kind of chunky blocks um, that are going to be fairly opaque, fill those in, and then on either side of them do little scratchy marks that get further and further apart. Uh, it kind of works as a rough blending technique um, because you know so the further apart the lines are, uh, the more the black primer shows through. Uh, it's almost sort of like a pointillism, but without dots using lines instead. Um, but you know the the uh, the concept is the same. The further apart the marks are, uh, showing the darker color underneath or lighter color or whatever way you would do it, um, it helps to make it look as a transition. Uh, and then you can see I just go around just picking out details. Um, you know, again, very rough. Uh, next stage, obviously. Baylor Brown going straight over the top of what you've just done with the XV88 uh, in a smaller area. So, you know, keep the, the middle bits nice and bright. You don't even have to go over the, the transition parts at the end, edges where you've got the, uh, you know, the scratchy marks and things. Very quick and simple. Also, don't worry too much if you're you mess up with the brush and you get kind of like sort of small blobs and things around the edges. Uh, you can see where I've just very quickly run the brush around the edges nearly all the way around on either side of these. Um, all it does is if you get, you know, you ac accidentally get a, a blob of paint on there, it just looks like a dent on the, the piece. Like there already are some dents sculpt and like scratches and all sorts. Uh, sculpted into the piece and you're just adding to that look you can see there I didn't even rub the paint off now so normally what I say is you rub the paint off on your thumb or on a um, like a, a slate or whatever you, you use for, for a paint surface uh, in this case I don't care um, I you know a, a blob on there actually helps to add to the the look of a shine uh, so you know that glare that you get on something shiny and by going over the edges with a you know a blob of paint, uh, it sort of reinforces that and tricks your eye into thinking that it's a shiny surface. And again, uh, obviously, don't forget to go over the the big chunky highlights that you've put on there as well. You can see my paint is really drying out on the surface now. Um, I need to add more water to my wet palette, but um, 
so because I'm doing this quickly uh, and also be, you know having slightly thicker paint for these uh, marks you get a very more much more opaque uh, finish uh, just remember that uh, if you're doing this not to do that for display level pieces because you're making uh, almost at like a three-dimensional sort of um, t like extra marks onto the model that would be visible uh, you know, um, it, it's not super neat is what I'm saying anyway you know try not to use extra thick paint it looks f like it's fine for tabletop it's fine for taking photos like if you use thick paint and you take a photo of it especially if you are uh, giving it a varnish coat at the end it'll look really nice in photographs and things in the flesh you can kind of see the bumps and things because of the thicker paint so um, you know, be what you can see there. I've gone back now and I've watered up all the paint and things because I was, <laughs> I was getting pretty aware that my paint was, uh, you know, getting too dry. But the nice thing is as well because the paint was so thick and I could get these very opaque marks on there. Um, and also, you know, don't bother painting on the insides of this. You can see, you know, all of the inside edges. They're all left pretty much black I will pick out some of them just because it looks a bit lazy otherwise but having that black there you've got that same thing again about light dark light and it makes the highlights stand out so much more and makes them shiny now here you can see the white dots that I'm putting on these are really important and you remember what I was saying about you know going over the edges you see how these are little round dots it makes it look like a shine um, you know, it really helps to, to sell you know tricking your eye into thinking that it's a shiny surface and then just the final thing to do is again go back with a uh, mornfang brown um, and you know just go very gently over some of the transitions don't go over the highlight areas you'll knock them back down uh, but you can go from kind of like the mid tones into the shadows and it just gives it a little bit more richness to the color so now we're going to paint the the wood effect um, just start by pretty much covering everything in Rhinox Hide. Uh, I also you know, don't forget or rather don't forget don't worry about the the spikes on these you just go straight over the top of them. Uh, there's so many of them that it'll take longer uh, to paint around them all than it would to just paint straight over the top with a brown and then pick them out in black later. Here you can see so I painted the back of the the wood effect uh, and you can, so that's the, the look we're going to go for. I've left the uh, uh, the front side obviously unpainted, so I'm going to show you a small section how to do that. I did, however, realise after I'd done this that I should have showed you how to paint the back of it because it doesn't have all these spikes on it, so it's a little bit easier. And especially because this section is kind of stuck against the model, you, you pretty much don't even see this side of the the cross that that much. Um, I keep calling it a cross. Oh you know, torch device, what, you know, whatever it is anyway. Uh, so now I'm going to, uh, so what you'll probably notice is that I haven't changed the colors from the non-metallics, um, which is fine, like it's just easy. Uh, but you could see on the, the back of the wood how I made it look afterwards with a little bit of glazing and things. It, you know, sometimes people get into their heads that a specific color means a, a specific thing. Uh, it doesn't help with paint companies when they name the uh, the colours. So you get things like Cadian Flesh Tone or, um, I don't know, whatever the name is. And you think, oh, that's what colour the thing is supposed to be. Because it says, oh, that's flesh. I'm supposed to use that for flesh. No, it's just a sort of a pinky colour. Uh, try and f don't focus on the names of things and just take the colour for what it is. Uh, so this is a brown. And I just used the, the XV88. And I just went over again, not even caring about any of the little spikes on there, just doing these long sort of rough wiggly lines going all the way down. Um, it's a sort of similar process again to the the lines that I did onto the the red and blue sections of the uh, the model. Um, but I, I've skipped a few colours here, so it doesn't look too much like the uh, the non metallic. So I started with the XV88. And now I've gone straight to the 50-50 mix of Baylor Brown and Ice Yellow. Uh, I am using a, the thinner brush, so this is a size 00, zero again, uh, like it is a worn out old one. Uh, it, it like I said, you're not going to see that much of this side of the, um, the, 
you know the spiky thing so uh, don't worry about being too perfect on this uh, but basically what you're doing is you're going over the lines that you've already done but in a very rough sense so sometimes you're adding lines that uh, you didn't do before uh, other times you are going straight over the top of lines you've already painted try and uh, push the the lightness of the lines more towards the edges of each kind of plank of wood so you can see there at this join section uh, I'm doing these as lighter uh, you see you know, as I progress I'll be doing that all over but also look for any kind of li little details that are on the wood and you can pick those out with the highlights as well so here there you see I, I've uh, gone a bit further done them all over now I'm using uh, is, I think this is a uh, warp stone uh, lightning uh, you can also use p3 yosin green uh, yeah warp, warp stone glow that's what I've used <laughs> um, it you know the actual green doesn't even matter that much it's just a case of um, again watering it down you only need about four parts water to one part paint uh, for this uh, particular color it's already got horrible coverage so again you don't have to go uh, quite as wet as some of the other colors um, and it's one it blends the the lines together two it really separates out the uh, the surface so the wood section doesn't look anything like the non-metallics also so when you're going over you know with these glazes you're going over even the highest highlight parts so there's not even that high contrast it makes everything you know there's no it doesn't go up to white it doesn't go down to black everything's sort of like a, a different shade of green uh, you know just from slightly light to slightly dark and then I've got some Montfang brown as well uh, you don't have to add this if you don't want I, I wasn't too sure about adding it or not it just adds a, a little bit of warmth to the color I, I was wondering maybe if the uh, you know the other colors that I'd added had made it a bit to kind of pale looking this adds a, a bit of warmth to it um, it's, you know you can you can use it or not it's, it's uh, up to you really and then finally just using a bit of a bad and black and I'm glazing this around anywhere where the wood touches a metal area it just adds a little bit of shadow so what will happen is when I paint the final metal parts on there it will you know create a high contrast when I put the the edges the edge highlights going around it so that they'll stand out a bit stronger and you can see you know for the glazing I'm doing I'm being very very rough in the the brush marks and placement and things like that uh, it, it's it's rough like I want it to be a rough surface anyway so there's no point in spending too long on this, especially because this is a very secondary part of the model the main thing is like the head area that's where everyone's interest is going to be um, it was this part of the model that actually annoyed me the most with all the extra detail um, you know the, the non-metallic filigree because obviously you have to do both sides uh, and all the chains and things it just takes uh, so much longer finally if you want uh, this the this final stage is just going back with the uh, Baylor Brown and Ice Yellow 50-50 mix um, just look for any small little areas and things just to pick them out uh, it helps you know to pick out some of the details makes it interesting uh, but you know don't spend too long doing it anyway so now we're coming up to the more final parts of the model uh, this is probably the the most annoying part actually on the, the whole model is all the chains for painting these in non-metallics uh, if there's any part on the model that would convince me to that I should have painted this with true metals it's all the chains because you kind of have to spend a bit of time picking out all the links um, the these circular bits that kind of lock onto the arms uh, these are fine actually these are quite nice uh, and they're very easy to make look non-metallic as well so what you do you kind of hold the model under a light uh, see where the the light volumes fall and just paint in a big kind of chunky highlight on that part and then at the edges of those do thin sort of scratchy marks uh, to help with transitions you can do these scratchy marks all over any of the metal areas as well 
uh, they help to give the impression of, of like nicks and dents and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, don't worry about all the grey uh, paints that I have on the, the wet palette. I was thinking maybe oh I might need to do different transitions and things. Ultimately I decided all I needed was neutral grey and pale grey blue. Even if you don't have those and you just have black and white you can just mix in like a roughly 50-50 mix I guess for something like neutral grey. Um, you know it doesn't have to be exact just as long as you have like a sort of a mid kind of grey and then a highlight colour that's a good few steps lighter. Uh, you know you're not looking for any perfect blending or anything like that. And here you can see just pick out the edges. Uh, apologies if you can hear any background sound my uh, washing machine is going. <laughs> You can see now how you know just those very few simple marks it gives a, a really nice high contrast looks like a, a nice shine on the model and because these are sort of quite focused like quite close to the head it's worth just spending uh, like a minute or two extra just to make sure they look nice and kind of interesting a bit neat as well they don't have to be perfect but just to um, you know pick them out but now you know the these chains uh, they are kind of horrible um, they they're straightforward in the sense that you're doing the same kind of thing so you take the neutral gray pick out the curve uh, you can see if you look in the video actually see how the light catches one sort of edge uh, paint towards that edge with a highlight uh, the natural translucency of the paint will mean that wherever you take the the brush off there's a it leaves a small deposit more paint at that point so you know you paint towards it uh, you get a slight transition and kind of a, a built-in highlight if you like um, and just you know do that for every rivet basically not rivet uh, every chain link and then if you want as well you can just put a few little scratches and things uh, I started doing that and then I changed my mind afterwards when I realized how many chain links I had to do uh, because obviously they're not just on this part you know the, the lower part of the model they are on the uh, the torture device that goes on his back as well uh, and then here you can see I'm up to the uh, pale grey blue and then quick as I can little dots uh, on the, the shiniest part uh, they did you know it did work quite nicely for very quick and simple non metallics uh, as I said it's not going to win you any competitions or anything like that uh, like if you were doing this properly uh, then you have to highlight each individual chain link and also the position of the highlights will depend you know it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't paint each one the same so some might be in uh, highlighted areas some might be in shadow um, all sorts of things like that so as I said it's a very stylized way of painting the metallics this uh, basically it means that I can do it quickly and not have to think about it um, and you know as I said it's very high contrast and stands out nicely on the battlefield uh, so obviously I've, I've taken this up a little bit higher um, if you look on the wet palette the, the kind of the top left paint that again would be the um, white grey uh, it looks a little bit darker in this image I'm not sure why that happened but it is basically almost white anyway and there you go you just spent a good half an hour or so painting all the, <laughs> the chain links in uh, so now for the final part of the model we're going to paint in the the green flame now this is quite simple um, back to the, the warpstone glow uh, this has such bad coverage uh, you can see very clearly here how uh, you know I'm painting on I'm not even rubbing the paint off I'm just loading that area up uh, so it kind of like floods the area and it just doesn't cover the black at all but that's actually quite nice in this regard because what I'm going to do is just layer over the top of it so there I just uh, I quickly used a hairdryer to make it dry down um, so after you did that first very heavy messy layer you can then just spend a little bit of time going over the top of it uh, pushing or like dragging rather the highlight layer always down towards the skull and what you'll find is because 
you always deposit a little bit more because of the water tension. Uh, wherever you take the brush off, especially with the, the more wet paint, it leaves a little blob extra of paint behind it. So what you're doing is you're creating a transition just using one colour. So you can see there, I haven't mixed any paints, I just layered over the top of it multiple times uh, and you get like a very sort of quick, easy transition. And then the, the final part, I've used Uriel Yellow. Uh, and this is just near the skull. Um, uh, you know, kind of like coming out of the eyes or whatever. Um, and just, so again, same process. Uh, you just have to be a little bit more careful. The Uriel Yellow is a much stronger colour than the uh, Warpstone Glow. Uh, and you, you, like, you're just looking for a slight transition. If you find that the yellow is a bit too bright, uh, while you've painted some of the yellow on, uh, dip your brush back into the Warpstone Glow and then you can see you can just do a little transition right at the edge and it helps to blend it in. If you're wondering on the base, all I did was give that a very quick wash of uh, Seraphim Sepia. That was it. So it's purely just sand glue to the base and then washed with Seraphim Sepia. Uh, and then you can see just for the, the final, super high contrast to get as much opacity on the yellow as well. So it's very, very saturated. Uh, just go over a few more times with the yellow. You can see how it's kind of like strong that color is now. You only need a very small part of saturation at the yellow, the very tips. Don't take it all the way along. That kind of takes away some of the saturation. So having a small bright yellow dot uh, makes it high contrast. So it makes the yellow even stronger. And the final thing to do after you've done all that is just to give the model a quick coat of uh, ultramatte varnish and that what that will do is take away all of the shine and things like that so everything becomes kind of even on the surface because what happens is especially when you've done non-metallics if you've got something that's a little bit shiny on the model uh, it messes with the highlight placement uh, when you look at it um, so you can get things like shine in sort of shadowed areas and you don't want those to stand out whereas if you've given everything a coat of ultramat the only the highlights that you have painted on then stand out um, but anyway so here's the, the final piece uh, all i did was just dry brush the uh, the little um gravestone on the base again very very simple and stuck a, a plant on that i uh, had from a, i think it's a mini nature plant um and and there you go that's it uh, as I said, like it is a tabletop piece, uh, I probably spent a little bit longer on this than I really wanted to. I, I was trying to do it quick, had a few family issues, um, you know, it made it take a bit longer than I really intended. I think it was probably around about five or six hours painting time, somewhere like that, which really is probably too long for a gaming piece. Uh, and really, usually if I'd spend that long on, on a model, I'd like it to look at probably a, a bit better than that. But um, I think you know. I think it does the job. It, it looks quite nice, and at least the you know it's high contrast and very bold, and it definitely stands out on the tabletop. Uh, but anyway, that's the the end of the video. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please subscribe uh, if you want to see more. Uh, that I've got so many more things uh, planned to come out, including some of the new vampire uh, soulblight grave lords from Games Workshop. Uh, uh, they're already uh, on my desk, uh, ready to start. Um, if you're interested in higher level painting, I have my website and Patreon where I do things for display level or things like, you know, for entering into Golden Demon if you want to push your skills a little bit higher. Uh, but as I said, that's the end of the video. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.